You know, we look at the, old, at the, the annual holy days, the festivals of Leviticus 23, and having seen a portion of them fulfilled in the New Testament, for example, we learned, we know that Christ, that his death occurred on the very day that the Passover lambs were sacrificed. And so you have the Apostle Paul telling us that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. And he goes on to say, let us therefore keep the feast, not with the unleavened, or not with the leavened bread of malice and deceit, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sincerity meaning single-mindedness, not double-minded, not having it both ways, not Christ and Belial, but single-mindedly, uh, which from that we understand that we're to live our lives in conformity to God's law. And so we see that very clearly in the Christ event, in the death of Jesus Christ, and of course the wave sheaf, we see his resurrection and ascension in that. And then you come on out to the day of Pentecost, and that was the day the Holy Spirit came. And so we begin to see more there. Look, this is the next of the annual high days, and the Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. We tie that in with the meaning of first fruits, and a harvest of first fruits, and so we begin to see it. And it will put it together. Now, of course, uh, all the holy days are not there. We don't see them being uh, something sp specific uh, in the plan of God happening on each one. We come to the Feast of Trumpets and say, oh, wait a minute, what is that about? Well, all you have to do then, once you've got this pattern established, you see that there is an unfolding plan. The thing you do is ask, what comes next? And so you start seeing this promise of coming again. You see his promise of coming on the clouds of heaven associated with trumpets. The trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise. You also see the seven trumpets associated with the coming of Christ in the book of Revelation. So you tie all that together and you say, well, trumpets, that makes sense. That, that pictures the second coming of Christ. And then we come to the Day of Atonement. And so far we have seen an unfolding plan going on. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We see the, uh, the wave sheaf. We see, you know, his ascension, his resurrection, his ascension. And also then we see the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, the beginning of this harvest of first fruits. And now we come to, we, we come to trumpets and, you know, out in the fall. And what is, what comes later at some point after uh, Pentecost? Well, what the event pictured in Pentecost? Well, the coming of Christ. Now then, when you look at the Day of Atonement, when you go back there and examine the atonement ritual itself, and also when you go to the book of Hebrews and begin reading about it and what it means to us, it seems like everything is now out of sequence, doesn't it? You ever notice that? The writer of the book of Hebrews speaks of Jesus Christ as the true high priest. Aaron, the high priest in the Old Testament, was but a type of the true high priest. He is going into the most holy place with the blood of bulls and goats, was but a type of the true sacrifice when Jesus Christ went into the true holy place, into the very presence of God himself, not with the blood of others, not with the blood of goats or bulls, but with his own blood. And we see that, and of course, we depend on it for our own salvation, don't we? But that seems to be something that happens before Pentecost. So here we are, it's almost out of sequence. You see what I'm talking about? So then that tells me that there must be more to it than a soteriological message, although you can't, you can't remove soteriology having to do with salvation, the study of salvation. There must also be an eschatological, that means having to do with the last things. The teaching of last things, or study of last things. It must have an eschatological message there as well, if indeed we're to continue this uh, unfolding plan of God uh, depicted in the holy days. So I ask you today, what does that mean then? What does the Day of Atonement mean? We understand about Christ as high priest going into the most holy place, and therefore he makes atonement for us. Similarly, how the high priest in the Old Testament went into the holy place with the blood of bulls and goats to make atonement. 
how he came out, laid his hands on the head of the live goat, and sent the goat into the wilderness. And you think about the powerful symbolism there. Very powerful, uh, knowing that the, the assembly was gathered around the tabernacle when this was going on. They knew what was going on inside there, that Aaron was going into the presence of God with the blood, the, the, the blood of propitiation to make propitiation for the people, for himself too, and for the people. And then he comes out, he professes Israel's sins on the head of that live goat and sends it away. In other words, you have propitiation on the one hand, and then you have full expiation. So the blood, the, the, the divine requirement has been met in the sacrifice, and now you have the effect of the sacrifice, which is expiation. Those sins put away as far as east is from west. So you can imagine what kind of powerful picture that was to the children of Israel when they watched that fit man, or the man appointed for the task, as he moved into the wilderness and all of their sins on the head of that goat. And he's gone to a place, well, we don't even know for sure the word Azazel is used. Uh, in most modern English translations, I think they capture the meaning better than the King James. King James leaves you the impression that the goat, the second goat, the live goat, is Azazel. But uh, I think actually what the meaning there is, is the goat is sent to Azazel. Not as an offering of any kind but sent to Azazel. Now some of the ancient commentators have different opinions of that. Some thought that Azazel was the name of a particular part of the desert. But others said, and this came later, but you know sometimes later traditions reflect an earlier belief. And I think that may be the case here, but Azazel was the name of a desert demon. In other words, we're talking about Satan here. In other words, send those nasty old sins and abominations and transgressions out there in the world of demons where they belong. Send them far away. You know, anytime someone was ceremonially unclean or, or just simply had been caught in some kind of transgression, sometimes part of the punishment was to be put outside the camp. You get them away from that tabernacle because it's holy. That's where God dwells. Put them outside the camp for a period of time. And in the case of this live goat, it was sent far outside the camp. The idea being out there where evil dwells. So, we see all of that, but again, I ask the question, what comes next then in the unfolding plan of God after the second coming of Christ, and how do we fit the symbolism of atonement into that scenario? Well, let's talk, we'll go back to Isaiah chapter 11 today, and we'll see here that there are many things that are mentioned that uh, are not necessarily in the order we would think that they should be presented. But that's because the prophets in many times, on many occasions, spoke in terms of what God promises and not necessarily filling in the details on when these various things would take place. So there's some big gaps in here that you don't immediately recognize. So let's begin in Isaiah 11 with a very well-known messianic passage. Chapter 11, verse 1, it says, A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse. I'm using the new uh, Revised Standard Version today, so it may be different from your, if you're using the King James, it'll be quite a bit different, <clears throat> but the same message is there. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now there's no question. We understand that this is talking about Jesus Christ. This is a messianic passage. This is that coming Davidic king. But here we're told that the spirit of the Lord rests upon him. And of course it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding and all of these other things. And clearly that is... That characterizes the earthly ministry of Jesus, doesn't it? The Spirit came upon him visibly at the baptism of John. And uh, the voice came from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So the Spirit of God did rest upon Jesus, did in fact drive him into the wilderness to be tested by the devil, uh, did in fact uh, impart to him everything he needed to accomplish his ministry. So this is talking obviously about the ministry of Jesus, the earthly ministry. 
goes on to say, you shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. You know, if we judged everything by what we see and hear today, if we're watching the news media or reading it off the internet, and uh, we're going to come to some wrong conclusions, I'll guarantee you. But here's how he judges. It says, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor. In other words, bring justice to. Judge, judge them justly. And these are the people who, who seek justice and righteousness. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Now, it's hard, it's hard to make out exactly. I, I suppose you could apply this to his ministry then and there, because remember, this is very poetic. This is poetic. And you could say that he figuratively slayed the, weak, the wicked with the words of his mouth. The rod of his mouth. Being, these are figures of speech. It's poetry. So you could understand it that way, or you could understand it literally as something that will take place in the future when he strikes the wicked and really does kill them when they do not repent. It says, righteousness, righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. So much of this, at least, is speaking about his earthly ministry. When he came here, when he chose his disciples, when he taught them, and when he sent them, <clears throat> trained them to, so that he could, <clears throat> would later send them. But now we go on to something else, and it becomes kind of difficult to interpret this as something that occurred in his ministry. It says, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Now, of course, that would be very deadly in today's world, wouldn't it? I don't think this actually happened back in the time of Jesus, did it? <clears throat> they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I don't think this still, we're still talking about his earthly ministry here, are we? I'm talking about his ministry that took place some 2,000 years ago. Don't think that's what we're talking about. Clearly there is an eschatological element to this. It looks toward the end. It took, looks for, toward that time when there will be harmony between all the orders of creation and a time when this Eden-like community is formed under the reign of the Messiah. And again, that didn't happen in his earthly ministry. So what are we seeing here? What we see here, without any separation, without any designation of time gaps and things of that nature, no intervals are, are mentioned. We're just told from the beginning, here uh, a, a shoot shall come forth from the stump of Jesse, Jesse being the father of David. In other words, the Messiah will come. He'll be filled with the Spirit of the Lord and uh, judge the meek and so on. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue here, the wolf is lying with the lamb and all these other things are going on. There's no, there's no suggestion that there's any kind of interval, is there? You would get the impression that he's born, he grows up, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and leads him to do his ministry, and then these things begin to come to pass right there as he is in his ministry. That at some point he takes the place, his place on the throne of his father David, and he begins to rule in Israel, because that's what we're talking about here. But that didn't happen that way, did it? That didn't happen that way. So you have to begin, you have to look at these promises like that. And if you're going to use the holy days as the grid, and I think it's a good idea to do that, then you can begin to see where these separation points are, where the intervals are in the text. He goes on here to say something Then this has, you may, be, you may be wondering at this point, what does all this have to do with the Day of Atonement? You will see before the end of the sermon. We'll get there. Maybe later on today, but where are you going? <laughs> Verse 10. There's no pot luck today. There's only a pot out of luck. Verse 10. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. 
Still talking about the same individual here. And it says, on that day. Oh, which day is that? It do, it's not clear in the text, is it? Again, you have to have some kind of grid to place these things on so you can begin to see the intervals and how it does actually unfold over the course of history. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Ethiopia, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He's talking about Israel. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, some people look at that, and we could talk about, say, Seventh-day Adventists, for example, and no, not, not criticizing them for it, but it's just their understanding. The Churches of Christ, the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, they look at this and they say, well, this is, this is past history. It's already fulfilled. All this came to pass, this restoration of Israel and all of that. That happened in history. It happened when they came back from the Babylonian exile. And now, so that's all past history. Forget about it. Now then, you read these passages like this. You understand it in a spiritual way. You apply it to the church, not to the nation of Israel. You kind of see where they're coming from, and there are certain elements of truth in all of that. But you know, when I read this prophets, what they say, and we'll see, they say it over and over and over again, that God is going to restore Israel. That this Messiah is going to restore Israel as a nation. And it's hard for me to spiritualize that and take it to mean, oh, well, he's, he's through with the physical nation of Israel. He's through with them forever. I guess he's going to work with all other nations, but not Israel. It, so it's hard for me to read, the, the read scriptures like this and just to say, well, okay, what do we do with this? Let's spiritualize it, transform this into the present day church. Really what we're going to see, what we're talking about here is when he regathers Israel, not merely to have a nation, not as a secular nation as the modern nation of Israel is, but a nation that turns to God. A nation that comes into covenant relationship with Him. And what do you call that? If the people then receive the Spirit of God, what would you call them? That is the church, isn't it? They become the church, or part of the church. But in any case, he goes on to say, The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, the hostility of Judah shall be cut off. In other words, these negative elements that define them are going to be gone. There's going to be a change of heart. This is what we're, tell, we're told here. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not be hostile towards Ephraim. And they shall swoop down on the backs of the Philistines on the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. In other words, they're in unison now, in harmony. They shall put forth their hands again against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and will wave his hand over the river with a scorching wind, and will split it into seven channels and make a way to cross on foot. So there shall be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that is left of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. So he's saying there's another exodus coming, another event similar to that in Egypt, only this one will be greater, this highway from Assyria, meaning he's going to bring these outcasts that were scattered all over the world back. Now, in answer, in answer to the common objection that this is referring to the return from the Babylonian exile, and it was fulfilled then, to, to, to answer that, uh, I would just say this, and that was, not, that was not the full punishment. Of course they went into the Babylonian exile. You had the three invasions of Nebuchadnezzar. The third, on the third one, he destroyed the temple. He took the rest of the people except for the poorest of the poor. They were left in the land. But nevertheless, that was the Babylonian exile. And yes, indeed, under Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, they did return and reestablish themselves. The temple was rebuilt. But that was not all of the punishment. 
That was not the fullness of the punishment. God said, I will scatter them among the nations. And what this is talking about is those scattered peoples, and they were scattered, come to the time of Jesus, you see this is called the diaspora. They were all over the known world, scattered. Israel and Judah, not having come back together as a nation. What this is saying, he's going to reach out a second time, the first time was in Egypt, and restore Israel by creating this highway, as it were, from Assyria. He'll bring, bring them home, in other words. So you see this over and over in the prophets. Let's go on over to uh, Jeremiah 31. See it again, Jeremiah 31. And beginning in verse 8, well, we're going back up to verse 7, says, For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. So here again, they're punished because of covenant breaking. They're scattered among the nations. Not just taken to one location from which they would later return, but scattered all over in all the nations of the world. He says, verse 8, See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come. And with cons consolations, I will lead them back. And you know, this never did happen. This is not the return from the Babylonian exile. This is a much greater gathering of Israel that's going to take place here. I will let them walk by the brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So again, he's talking about this restoration of Israel by gathering them, and he knows where they are. We don't need to sort through all that. He knows where they are by gathering them from all the nations that they've been scattered among. And again, I say, that never did happen. The diaspora has remained uh, a real thing from ancient times till the present. And this present nation of Israel, that's not, some people say, oh, look at these wonderful prophecies here. They're being fulfilled before our very eyes with the, uh, you know, 1948, Israel became a nation again. I'm, and I said, no, 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 no. No, this happens under the reign of the Messiah. This happens after Jesus Christ comes back. So it's a little clue right there as to what happens next after the coming of Christ. We've got, I've given you a little clue, if not the full answer. But anyway, he goes on to say it's in this context when he's talking about bringing the people back. He says this, he says in verse 31, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you say, well, wait a minute, Jesus came and did that, did he not? He said, my blood is the blood of the new covenant. He shed his blood. You see the writer of the book of Hebrews tying that in with the new covenant. What Christ did, what he accomplished in his death, resurrection, and ascension, and present role as high priest. He ties that in to both the day of atonement and the establishment of the new covenant. Uh, well, yeah, he does. But see, there's more to it than just that. There's more to it. And we, the relationship we have with God, you and I, is based on the terms of this covenant he's talking about here. That's true. But see, we reflect back on Pentecost and we realize that there is a first fruits harvest. And here we're talking about something coming later. Do you see it? So there will come a time when he will establish or will make a new covenant with this reconstituted nation. There will be conversions widespread in this new nation because there will be a change of heart. So the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, both brought back together. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will abolish my law. No. No. So, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And it's going to be internalized, not merely an external thing on tables of stone or in a book someplace. Then we can give lip service to and acknowledge its existence. But no, it's going to be written on their hearts. It'll be internalized. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord. Now the reason they won't have to say that is for a, a one, one, one reason. And it's said right here. For they shall all know me. In other words, this is going to be universal among this, this reconstituted nation. It's not going to be a remnant here, a few scattered ones here and there that are faithful to God. No, the whole nation at this point will be. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. Now this is very, very important. Very important. It has to do, everything to do with the meaning of this day. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. What do you think is the meaning of seeing that second goat leave with the sins of Israel on its head? It means this out of sight, out of sight now, gone as far as east is from west. I will remember their sin no more. So this is, this is prophetic. It's a mistake to take this and put it only in the past or in the time of Jesus and apply only to us now. There's coming a time, according to all these many prophecies, that Israel will be restored and they will have then what you and I have now. The Spirit of the living God received, it, received under the terms of the New Covenant. look at another passage, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Talking about the same thing, the renewal of Israel. He says in verse 19, I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the, the countries. In accordance with their conduct and their deeds, I judged them. You know what's interesting also to, to make note of, and that's, we're talking about national punishment. It's interesting though that in there there was always a remnant within Israel, a righteous remnant. There were always those who were faithful to God. And you know what happened to them? They went in exile as well. They were scattered along with the others. But uh, the time has come, will come when there will no longer just be a, a remnant. There was a, put it this way, there was always a true Israel among within Israel. You might put it that way. And of course, that's what the New Testament church began with, that remnant, the righteous remnant. And then to them were grafted in, added other peoples. That's why Paul gives the olive tree analogy, where you have the rebellious, the unfaithful Israelites being cut off, and the Gentiles grafted in. They become a part of Israel's tree. So you see a continuity, definitely continuity between Israel and the church. You can't separate those two. You have the unfolding plan of God. They are continuous in that sense. But then you have to ask the question, what about those branches that were lopped off, left lying on the ground to die? You know, Paul answers that question for us in the book of Romans. He says, God is able to graft them in again. Is that not what we're reading about right here? The time will come when he will graft them in again. And once he does that, then he will reach out to the rest of the world. You know, we see, we see God acting in the world today. We see people receiving the Spirit. But as the old saying goes, you ain't seen nothing yet. When these things begin to come to take place under the reign of King Messiah, then you're going to see some real conversions uh, big time around the world, in Israel and around the world. And, you know, since you're part of the first fruits harvest, you're called to be a part of that. You'll be a part of that. What a wonderful thing to think about that. You'll be a part of converting and changing and transforming this world. That's what it means when it says we will reign with Christ. Drop down to verse 24. It says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Verse 26. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. 
And I will re remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That didn't happen when they came back from Babylon, did it? Didn't happen. No, they, they started going back the old way again. A few things had to happen to stop that. Then you come on down to the time of Jesus and they'd really gone the other way. Just read Matthew 23. It becomes very clear. He says, I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You mean those things are going to be enforced under the new covenant? Well, yeah, according to this. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. So time of great blessing, but the main thing here is a time of great spiritual blessing when he puts his spirit within them. That means conversion. Conversion. That means they become Christians. If you want to use that word, believers. The real thing, like you and I are today. So the whole nation at that time will be converted under the reign of Christ. And of course you know what the purpose of that is. It's not just because he's, uh, he's, uh, they're his favorite people. Because they have a mission to the rest of the world. The law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, to all the nations around about, to all the nations of the world. The nations will say, let's go up to the house of the God of Israel, because they'll see it like the city shining, sitting on a hill. They'll see it, they'll be drawn to it, attracted to it. Let's go and learn of his ways. So, with all of this in mind then, you look at the Feast of Trumpets, picturing the second coming of Christ, and you have to ask the question, what comes next? What comes next in this prophetic picture, the picture that we're kind of putting together here as the prophets address the what, but not necessarily the when? Well, what comes next after the coming of Christ is the restoration of Israel, beginning with a remnant. But he reaches out to all the, the rest of the world and brings back the scattered Israelites to form them into one nation again. That's the only thing I can make of these scriptures because I know these things did not happen when they came back from the Babylonian exile. And, they're still, and to this day they're still scattered among the nations. So God will have his purpose be fulfilled in Israel and use Israel as a means of reaching to the rest of the world. So what would happen? Well I want you to think about what happened on the Day of Atonement. When the high priest on this considered most solemn and holy day, when he went into the most holy place, you know a lot of things he had to do, we won't go through the whole ritual, it involved all kinds of washings and changing of clothes and all sorts of things like that. Uh, because here, after all, he, he is, uh, this is the one day of the year when he is going into the inner sanctuary. And he knows he's got to do it all right, just the way God instructed him. Otherwise, he can get in there and get himself killed. Didn't want that to happen. He's going to make sure everything is done properly. So the sacrifice has to be a proper sacrifice and everything that happens has to be done properly. So he goes in, he sprinkles the blood in the presence of God on behalf of the people, first on behalf of himself and his household, but then on behalf of the people. And then he comes out. Now keep in mind, where is Israel at this point? They're situated around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was placed in the heart of the nation. So there's their the encampment. This is in, when they were in the wilderness. So they're around the tab tabernacle, and of course many are gathered there to witness what is going on insofar as they can. And they know the high priest is on, going into the most holy place in the presence of God on their behalf. And they know that their sins and their transgressions and all the things, all the, the wrongdoing, their uncleanness, all of that is today is being dealt with. They know that's what's going on. The propitiatory sacrifice has been made. The blood is sprinkled in the most holy place. In other words, it's as if Aaron goes in and says, here's the proof. So he sprinkles the blood in the presence of God. 
and then he comes out then he comes out and still the people are around about while this is going on aware ideally some of them probably didn't didn't care but uh, ideally aware of what is taking place on this day knowing that they have an opportunity now to make things right to restore their relationship with God let's do it right from now on and not uh, get in trouble again and especially just how powerful it is when they see that second goat being led away there goes there goes all our sins it's being removed from us well there will come a time there will come a time if you look at it on the in the prophetic sense there will come a time when all Israel will be gathered once again around the most holy one the high priest the true high priest the one whose blood can take away permanently take away sins and they'll experience atonement in the fullest and truest sense on that day so what does this day picture prophetically we know what it pictures for us how important it is for us in our salvation well he's not finished he's working with us but he's not finished with the rest of the world it pictures the time when God will restore Israel and bring Israel into covenant relationship with him that is the beginning of reconciliation with the whole world at that point that's what happens atonement is made with Israel so that it can then extend to the rest of the world we've called it at one month God wants the world to be at one with him reconcile completely and this day pictures the beginning of that reconciliation and it's something too big to miss and too big to miss it will involve you and me participating in that in bringing the world to conversion so it begins here on this day of atonement and so we have something incredible to look forward to I'd like to go over to the book of Hebrews just to read a few passages here keeping in mind what we have covered here today in chapter 9 verse 23 he says thus it was necessary for the sketches of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites but the heavenly things themselves need better sacrifices than these in other words Aaron came in with the blood of bulls and goats and the daily sacrifices that went on you know constantly day by day the priests were standing uh, in the tabernacle area were offering the sacrifices and this went on continually day after day after day and of course these were things ordained of God he's the one that put this sacrificial system in place but the writer is telling us that the heavenly things these are only picture the heavenly things the heavenly thing the heaven is heaven itself the true tabernacle requires better sacrifices in order for the fullness of atonement to be made for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands a mere copy of the true one but he entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own for then he would have Christ he Christ meaning Christ would have to have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world but as it is he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself that's the propitiatory sacrifice the ultimate one the one that all other sacrifices pointed to and just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment so Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time and there's your second coming there not to deal with sin meaning it's, this is something he's already accomplished his work of atonement the propitiatory sacrifice has already been made but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him and that will be you and me so that's what that's one thing he's going to do when he comes back but there's some there's more to it look at chapter 10 verse 11 he says and every priest stands day after day 
at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. I want you to know the, notice the contrast that you may have missed in reading over this in the past. Notice that they stand day after day after day, bringing again and again the same sacrifices. And this is just an ongoing process. They stand daily. Now notice what this high priest does. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down. He sat down. In other words, his work is finished. The propitiatory work of sacrifice is done. It hasn't been applied yet in every place, but it has been accomplished. Sat down at the right hand of God and since then has been waiting... And he refers here to Psalm 110 and verse 1, until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. Now we understand, of course, that he participates in the process of making his enemies a footstool. You read about it in Revelation chapter 19. He comes on a white horse with a sword from his mouth. He, tre he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of God. So not only will he come to give salvation, final salvation to those who eagerly wait him, he's also going to deal with the wicked in that day, those who oppose him. So he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, as we're told in Revelation 19. And he goes on to say, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make after those days, says the Lord. And here again, you see, he ties in that once for all sacrifice with the establishment of the new covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. It's not needed. It's not needed. You don't need animal sacrifices when you have this sacrifice. And so, even though the writer here is applying the, this to the people then present, and of course we apply it to ourselves, that is how we are reconciled with God, but more importantly, for our purposes today, it's important to realize that that is exactly how the reconstituted nation of Israel will one day be reconciled with God. The same means through that once for all sacrifice. In that day, they'll finally at long last recognize it for what it is. In that day, when they come back, when they're brought back with weeping and fasting because they're turning to God finally, not away from Him, and in that day when he cuts out that stony heart and replaces it with a heart of flesh, fills them with his spirit, then they'll experience the fullness of reconciliation. Then we're going to see Jerusalem as it was intended to be from the beginning. You'll see it as a light to the world, the model nation, and the rest of the nations also then will conform. You know, we read about that, that, what happens after that. That would take us on out to the Feast of Tabernacles. We read in Zechariah, for example, how Zechariah 14, how that uh, Christ will reach out to those roundabout nations. He names some of them, including Egypt. And those nations immediately roundabout are made up largely of Muslims, aren't they? Can you imagine how they might feel about it when he says to the remainders of those nations, when he reaches out and says, I want you to come up to Jerusalem because there's not going to be any more Ramadan, but you will sit down with these Jews and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I wonder how they'll feel about that. Well, they might change their mind when they don't come and find out they're having no rain and their crops are failing and, and you know, it, Times are not good for them. But in any case, that takes us on out into the Feast of Tabernacles. But before we get there, before we get there, it has to begin with the, rest, the restoration of Israel and atonement has to be made with them so that they might become the model nation for the rest of the nations. And then we move out into the Feast of Tabernacles. 
So that's, uh, that's one of the, there are many other features we could probably look at as far as the meaning of atonement goes, but that is definitely one of them there. When God establishes his covenant, the same one, to, we, we have already agreed to the terms of that covenant, you and I have. He's already written his law in our hearts if we have the Spirit of God within us, and I believe we do. And we're already in that relationship with him. And so let's look forward and rejoice, forward to, and rejoice in the fact that eventually he's going to do that with Israel and through Israel, the rest of the world. That's our future. That's what we have to look forward to. May God speed the day when that begins to happen.